welcome to the seventh annual Three Minute Thesis competition. This is the Graduate School's most exciting event of the year, and we're delighted you're here to share that experience with us. We have nine competitors. After each competitor gives their 3MT talk, we're going to pause for about a minute and a half to two minutes to give the judges time to fill out their scoring sheets, and then we'll move on to the next competitor. Competitors, are we ready? Our first competitor is Jordan Wright, a PhD student in mechanical engineering in the College of Engineering. The title of his dissertation is Design of Thermoset Composites for Additive Manufacturing Utilizing Artificial Intelligence. His advisor is Emra Chalik. Did y'all know that the humans can snap their fingers in just three milliseconds? In fact, it's the fastest human body movement that we can do, 20 times faster than the blink of an eye. It's instantaneous, yet so simple. However, as an engineer, we don't typically work within the realm of instantaneous or simple. In manufacturing, raw materials don't immediately become the final product. When developing materials, fine-tuning and enhancing their properties doesn't happen in a snap. They both require tedious processes that take time to complete. But what if I told you we can change the properties of a material just like that? What, but more so, what if we can do it in the middle of manufacturing and have AI do it for us? In my research, I use 3D printing technology to instantly change the properties of fiber reinforced composites. I focus on how different 3D printing parameters can affect a composite's electrical and mechanical properties. And what I have found is that changing even a single parameter can make a drastic impact. You see, my composites are made out of carbon fibers smaller than the human hair suspended in epoxy resin. This means, this means that they're able to move. And this mobility is what allows me to directly control their alignment and thus the properties of my composites. For instance, as you can see to my right, using optimal parameters will cause the fibers to become highly aligned and create a composite that's super strong and can withstand a large amount of force, like brackets in an airplane that hold the plane together. But by changing even a single process parameter directly in the middle of manufacturing, the fibers will start to misalign, creating an entirely different composite that's electrically conductive, like a circuit. You see, no manufacturing method has been able to drastically change the properties of a single material just like that. This opens up an entirely new realm of composite design that no one has yet discovered. But I can teach AI this information about how 3D printing can change the properties of composites to design and manufacture ultra lightweight parts that are smart enough to uh, perform various functions. With AI, we can design airplane wings that can heat themselves in frigid temperatures or design structural components that can store energy like a battery, or even embed health monitoring se sensors directly into a part that lets it notify engineers when it's about to fail and needs to be replaced. You see, these examples might seem like the work of science fiction, but my work has closed the gap and opened up the possibility of bringing these novel structures to life. And with AI, it can be done in a snap. Thank you. Ocean color is a field where scientists discern what's in the ocean by examining pictures captured from outer space. For instance, from this picture of the ocean surrounding Florida's peninsula, we may conclude that the bright white regions are areas that contain a shallow sandy bottom, whereas the greener regions indicate an increase in phytoplankton populations, and the dark blue signifies the depth of the abyss. But there are other properties of light besides color. James Maxwell succeeded in unifying the experiences of his time into a single set of, of equations through which it was found that light behaves as a wave. Here we can see peaks. The height of these peaks is related to intensity. The distance between two of these peaks is wavelength, and the direction these peaks point, whether up and down, side to side, or any direction in between, is polarization. Two of these properties we are intimately familiar with because our eyes are equipped to discern them. Intensity is related to brightness, wavelength to color. But then there's polarization. Our eyes can't detect it, but some specially made cameras called polarimeters can. Most polarimeters require capturing three separate images. When applied to the ocean, however, because the water is flowing, when these images are combined, 
they no longer align perfectly and we get blurring. The top circular image here shows the results of such a design. My polarimeter, however, named Pixpole, seen here floating on the ocean surface, can get that information from just one image. Whereas previous studies may have suffered from being blurry, my, my instruments are a lot clearer. In the two circular images seen at the bottom of the slide, taken by Pixpole, the left one is of the open ocean, while the right is of the coastal area. Between the two, we can see a clear difference. That difference gives clues as to as what might be in the ocean, whether it be sand, plankton, particles, or the lack thereof. Indeed, NASA plans to have a polarimeter on board its next Earth-observing satellite set to launch early 2024. However, because the satellite is in outer space and the ocean at sea level, the air we breathe lies in between. So, we, in this air will change how the image looks. To make sure that the corrections are correct, one needs to be able to compare between an image taken from space and one taken from a camera under, under the water. My instrument can perform this comparison. Therefore, it will aid in the ability to unlock knowledge of what is in the world's ocean through satellite pictures, which are capable of imaging the entire Earth every two days for decades throughout time. Thank you. The next competitor is Bailey Hinckley Grogan, a DMA student in studio music and jazz voice in the Frost School of Music. The title of her essay is A Study of the Lives and Careers of Six Black Female Jazz Instrumentalists, Belida Snow, Pauline Brady, Melba Liston, Flora Bryant, Terry Pollard, and Dorothy Ashby. Her advisor is Katherine Reed. Why Women Musicians Are Inferior. This is a real article title published by the esteemed jazz magazine Downbeat. The article's author argues that women are the weaker sex, that their emotional instability stymies their ability to be consistent on their instrument, and even goes as far to ask questions as, how can you blow a horn with a brassiere? While well, granted this article was published in 1941, the idea that it was published at all is a clear example of the damaging narrative women musicians face in jazz. Valida Snow, Dorothy Ashby, Clara Bryant, Pauline Brady, Terry Pollard, and Melba Liston. These names may be foreign to you, as well as many jazz musicians, but they hold an important lineage in jazz history. All were amid or beginning a career in jazz as instrumentalists at the time that this article was published. My research unearths the forgotten pioneers of jazz history, the black American female instrumentalists whose sounds go unheard and stories forgotten. Let me just tell you about a couple of these instrumentalists and explain why they deserve to be remembered in jazz history. Dorothy Ashby was a jazz harpist in the 1950s in Detroit. She played the harp, which is a traditionally classical instrument in a jazz setting. She was an advocate for black Americans, for women, and challenged what it meant to be, challenged the status quo of what it meant to be a jazz instrumentalist. And Melba Liston was one of the most respected jazz arrangers and trombone players of the 20th century. With over 400 recording credits in the Recording Academy, she is without a doubt one of the most sought after arrangers of both Dizzy Gillespie and Quincy Jones, both claiming her to be vital to their work. This research is special for me. I am a woman and I am also a jazz musician. Women's involvement in jazz has always been scarcer than men's. In fact, numbers continue to show that there's a stark difference between men and women's participation at both educational and professional performing levels. In 2019, a study conducted showed that 46% of college-aged women discontinued the pursuit of jazz with one of the number one reasons being representation. This is a primary motivator for my research. We deserve to know the names of these six women like we do Louis Armstrong and Duke Ellington. My research focuses on these six women, but black American voices across all corners of US history deserve to be lifted up and heard, and there's no better place to start than with America's own classical music, jazz. It is the art form built out of diverse backgrounds, overcoming in the struggle of black America. It is interwoven into our very cultural fabric, but if we don't remember all the key players who created this art form, we lose an important part of cultural history in the United States. Thank you.
The next competitor is Acadia Moyersums, a PhD student in cancer biology at the Miller School of Medicine. The title of her dissertation is Harnessing the Molecular Determinants in the Management of Ocular Cancers. Her advisor is Daniel Pelias. Picture this. You're looking in the mirror one day and notice a new speck on one of your eyes. You go to the eye doctor and are told it could be one of two scenarios. Scenario A, you have a harmless benign growth. In fact, 80% of benign looking growths turn out to be benign. Or scenario B, you have a precancerous growth and risk developing squamous cell carcinoma. 20% of patients will reach this fate. You could wait to see if it gets worse, but the only way to tell for sure is to have it surgically biopsied and sent to a pathologist to have a diagnosis come back in a couple of days. But if you wait too long and it is cancer, most likely part of your eye will have to be surgically removed. How do you know if you're in scenario A or scenario B? Up until now, the only way to tell is to have a scalpel put to your eye, which is painful, risks infection, and is emotionally taxing. Due to this high diagnostic threshold, shockingly, many people want to avoid having a scalpel put to their eye. What if instead of this type of biopsy, your doctor offers to take a couple drops of your tears and run a laboratory test like a COVID PCR test we've all taken and we'll know your diagnosis in a couple of hours. My thesis project focuses on developing less invasive, sensitive diagnostic tests using the molecular information in your tears. Yes, your tears. Tests like these are extremely important for communities such as South Florida, where UV exposure significantly increases the risk of developing eye surface cancers. This tear collection only requires small paper strips to be placed on the bottom lid of your eye. I then extract RNAs from the tears absorbed on these strips and run a qPCR test on a proprietary panel of genes I've identified through genetic sequencing. So far, I've identified six genes that are able to distinguish between a type of cancerous growth called ocular surface squamous neoplasia and a benign growth it's most commonly mistaken for, called a pterygium. I have now established a pipeline we are using to develop novel diagnostic tests for nine additional diseases of the eye surface, thanks to the Research to Prevent Blindness Foundation and our very own Bascom Palmer Eye Institute. With this novel test, we can leverage the diagnostic power of tears to detect cancer earlier in a painless and precise way and do away with putting a scalpel to your eye. Thank you. The next competitor is Chloe Kirk, a PhD student in biochemistry and molecular biology at the Miller School of Medicine. The title of her dissertation is The Disassembly of Physiological Amyloids. Her advisor is Stephen Lee. How do our cells handle stress? Our bodies are made up of 37 trillion cells. And within each cell, millions of proteins are tightly organized to perform functions in our bodies. Think of each cell as a busy intersection, like the image on the left, that only functions because of a precise series of traffic lights, pedestrian walkways, bicyclist lanes, and everyone following the same rules. Now our cells, just like our bodies, can become stressed from the environment, like heat, not enough food, and toxins. When our cells become stressed, those tightly organized intersections can break down. Imagine that intersection again, but during a thunderstorm. The proteins, or vehicles, are ignoring the rules of the road. Now cars are going twice as fast, bikes are zigzagging between lanes. It's chaos and lead a lot of cell mutations and death. Fortunately, our cells have a remarkable way to handle cell stress. So these intersections don't spiral into chaos at the first sign of trouble. Our cells have found a way to store and protect certain proteins in the center of the cell during stress. We call these formations amyloid bodies, those red dots you see in the center of the cell on the right. So we have these amyloid bodies forming to protect proteins during stress. Going back to our busy intersection, the vehicles that could cause the most damage during the thunderstorm are kept inside a temporary shelter, the amyloid body, to protect them. This halts traffic at the intersection, stopping normal cell function. After the thunderstorm passes, the vehicles can go back to the normal business. The amyloid body disassembles. And I study how the amyloid body recovers after the stress goes away. Understanding cell stress can help us understand diseases that stress out cells, like cancer. 
Cancer takes all those vehicles in the cell and runs them at super speed to grow bigger and faster, which in turn stresses out the cells. We've seen that amyloid bodies can use cancer cells to tide from being killed by cancer-killing drugs. In my research, I've discovered the mechanism for how amyloid bodies recover, how the cell handles stress, and it all depends on energy levels. The energy the cell uses is something called ATP. ATP for cells is like fuel for cars, and on a sunny day, lots of cars using lots of ATP to get around. But during stress, cells stop using as much ATP, and instead, form amyloid bodies. I found that adding ATP, or giving the system fuel during stress, actually got rid of amyloid bodies, meaning that even during the thunderstorm, the vehicles were able to move about because they had fuel. I also found that ATP works with a small group of proteins in the amyloid body to disassemble itself. This mechanism transforms how we understand cell stress. We can use this energy-based mechanism to both recover amyloid bodies and target cancer cells using them to hide. Thank you very much. The next competitor is Caitlin Avilas, a PhD student in communication in the School of Communication. The title of her dissertation is Season of the Witch, Exploring the Ambiguities of the Witch as a Feminist Figure in Contemporary Hollywood Entertainment and on Social Media. Her advisor is Christina Lane. Have you noticed that witches are everywhere recently? You may be familiar with the classic examples such as The Wizard of Oz or Bewitched. You may also be familiar with more contemporary examples such as the horror film The Witch or The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina. Witches are also popular on social media as well. For example, the TikTok hashtag WitchTalk has amassed over 36 billion views as of last month. My research argues that the witch is much more than entertainment, but can also serve as a proxy for contemporary society's feelings about the environment. In essence, witches are a reflection of the times in which they appear. Historically, US interest in witches has risen when the relationship between the human and the non-human world has been in a crisis. In times of political and social upheaval, such as the environmentalist and feminist movements of the 60s and 70s, people have turned to the witch as a symbol of resistance. Conversely, others may see the witch as a threat to the status quo. My research utilizes cultural studies and environmental communication to explore how contemporary witch media allows us to collectively think about our feelings toward the environment. While we tend to think of environmental issues in scientific terms, my dissertation argues that there is a significant relationship between environmentalism and media. And what I've often found is that in this type of media, nature tends to be pretty binary, right? It's either good or bad. For example, on Witch Talk, you have images in which filters are used to create pristine, romantic photos where nature is nothing more than an artificial backdrop. Images like this tend to reduce environmentalism to a visual rather than real-world action. Conversely, you also see terrifying depictions of nature. A show like Sabrina has nature filled with horrifying monsters that present the narrative that the environment is antagonistic to humans. Both of these images continue to perpetuate negative stereotypes about the environment that have gotten us into the climate crisis. But there is hope. Other films and TV shows are taking their environmental messages seriously. For example, a show like Fort Salem recently had a group of witches taking down a fracking company. And more importantly, the show illustrated the dangers that fracking does to both the environment and humans. So through The Witch, we can use storytelling and visual media to create more effective environmental communication strategies in the future. Instead of abandoning these images, environmental communication researchers can use the popularity of The Witch to bring the magic back to environmentalism. Thank you. The next competitor is Kelsey Johnson Sapp, a PhD student in marine biology and ecology at the Rosenseal School of Marine, Atmospheric, and Earth Science. The title of her dissertation is The Interacting Effects of Algal Symbionts, Seasonality, Environmental History, and Local Selection on the Thermal Tolerance of Threatened and Endangered Caribbean Corals. Her advisor is Andrew Baker. What if I told you that there are cities in the ocean? 
These cities, like our own, have vibrant neighborhoods with diverse residents and highways with busy traffic. And like every city, they have their problems. As we forecast the fates of our coastal cities in an era of climate change, these ocean cities are already crumbling within its grip. These ocean cities are coral reefs, and like many great cities before them, their legacy faces an uncertain future. As the planet warms, so do our oceans. And this ocean warming is what causes the coral animal to undergo a process called bleaching, where they turn white after losing their primary food source and can eventually die from starvation. This process is what has led to the collapse of over half our coral reefs all over the world. Coral decline is even more dramatic near coastal cities, like Miami, where nutrient runoff, fishing pressure, and dredging have further decimated Florida's coral reef, the third largest in the world. Ironically, the expansion of Miami has become the cause of its contraction. Coral reefs serve as a living seawall that protects our coastline, reducing wave action upwards of 95%. As coral reefs disappear, so does the line between the ocean and Miami's city limits. In order to stop and reverse coral decline, laboratories like mine specialize in identifying the rare types of corals that do not bleach during ocean warming. These rare corals can be collected and then used to build back degraded reefs to prevent bleaching in the future. But what me and my colleagues have found is that the most reliable places to find these super corals are right off the coasts of the very cities that once threatened to destroy them. It turns out what could be considered one of our greatest mistakes could actually become our greatest redemption. Although coastal development in Florida has reduced coral populations, the individuals that survived are remarkable. Just like how a city lifestyle can harden people, the urban pressure on corals offshore of Miami and Fort Lauderdale has engineered stress-hardened reefs. Our laboratory tests have revealed that these urban corals can last over 70% longer during warming conditions than more remote corals, may actually incorporate nutrients from pollution, and could even be immune to common coral diseases. By sourcing corals from urban reefs for restoration, we will ensure a bleaching-resistant future for our natural ones. But we must act urgently if we are to leverage this discovery before continued urban development buries the last vestiges of our coral reefs. In this modern landscape where cities above and beneath the waves may first seem at odds, we must reimagine how the missteps of one city can save them both. This is how we begin backing away from the ledge. This is how we reconcile our complicated past with coral reefs to become the deserving guardians of their future. Thank you. The next competitor is Katherine Gerber, a PhD student in nursing science in the School of Nursing and Health Studies. The title of her dissertation is Neuroinflammatory Biomarkers, Symptoms, and Functional Outcomes in Individuals Who Have Sustained Traumatic Brain Injury. Her advisors are Charles Downs and Joseph DeSantis. Good evening, everyone, and tonight I will be speaking to you about a very important topic. If you look on the slide behind me, you will see three pictures, each depicting the same concept. Traumatic brain injury, also known as a TBI. The first picture is a personal example. When I was younger, my brother and I were sledding. My brother fell off the sled, hit his head on the ice, and sustained a concussion, which is also known as a mild TBI. In the second example, the Miami Dolphins quarterback, Tua, has been making both local and national headlines, sparking debates regarding concussion protocol and return to play policies. Finally, the third example occurred a mere two weeks ago. My friend was serving on duty as a police officer when he was involved in a motor vehicle accident and sustained a head injury. This is a persistent problem in our community and something that we need to continue to understand. My research in TBI focuses specifically on the rehabilitation period, which is defined as the three to 12 month period post-injury. This is important because unlike the acute period, which is focused on patient stabilization, or the chronic period, which is focused on maintenance, the rehabilitation phase is a period during which rapid identification and treatment of symptoms has the ability to salvage function and improve outcomes in TBI patients. My research is being conducted at a level one trauma center here in Miami and is a cross-sectional study. Thus far, we have indeed found that an increase in TBI severity is correlated with both an increase in symptom frequency and symptom burden, as you will see depicted on the pie graphs behind me. Red indicating the most severe form of TBI, yellow indicating moderate, and green indicating mild. 
we have found an association between an increase in TBI severity and a decrease in age, which indicates that younger patients may be at risk for adverse TBI outcomes. Memory problems have been consistently reported across all domains of TBI severity as the number one concern. Finally, we have found a significant association between an increase in severe head pain and an increase in depressive symptoms. This has important implications related to clinical practice and precision medicine, as being able to rapidly identify and treat head pain has the ability to mitigate depressive symptoms and thus facilitate healing among TBI patients. To conclude, more TBI research is needed to continue to understand and improve clinical outcomes among the TBI population. This has far-reaching implications ranging from the childhood soccer field all the way to the Super Bowl. Thank you. Tonight's final competitor is Yini Wang, a PhD student in business in the Miami Herbert Business School. The title of her dissertation is Shifting Barriers to PCA OB Inspections, Evidence from Chinese Companies Listing Decisions and Audit Quality. The, title, the name of her advisor is Miguel Menuti Meza. The U.S. capital market is the top global listing venue for international companies. Companies from more than 50 foreign countries trade their shares in the U.S. to fund their operations. To protect U.S. investors, the capital market watchdog, PCAOB, inspects their financial statement auditors. Among all foreign jurisdictions, the PCAOB struggle to inspect China. However, Chinese companies represent almost 20% of all foreign companies listed in the U.S. Given such major presence, their lack of compliance with the PCAOB's inspection regime has raised wide concerns from regulators and investors. In 2020, following a high-profile accounting scandal by one of the Chinese companies, Larkin Coffee, the U.S. Senate passed an act that threatens to delist non-compliant Chinese companies within three years. Now that the entire world cares more about the current status of Chinese companies, we actually understand very little about the path leading to the current status. So in this paper, I start by introducing a comprehensive timeline of the 15-year struggle between the PCOB and Chinese regulators, featuring two critical events. First, in 2013, the two sides enter a memo of understanding that boosted PCOB's inspection access. And second, in 2017, the PCOB concluded break-off cooperation with Chinese regulators that substantially reduced PCOB's inspection access. And I asked two questions here. First, how did the two events affect Chinese companies' global listing decisions? And second, for those Chinese companies that chose to be listed in the, in the US, how did the two events affect their financial reporting quality? Turns out, over 95% of global listing events for Chinese companies took place in either US or Hong Kong. Focusing on these two specific venues, I find that smaller Chinese companies prefer Hong Kong to US after the 2013 event, and politically sensitive Chinese companies prefer Hong Kong to US after the 2017 event, but there is no substantial variation in financial reporting quality. Overall, variation in PCOB's inspection access has a direct consequences in the appeal of US market to Chinese companies. The findings in this paper can have important uh, policy implications. With the current one-size-fits-all approach, the U.S. regulators can be pushing prominent Chinese companies towards other global markets and ultimately lose a market cap of two trillion U.S. dollars. Thank you. All right, so our runner-up is Kelsey Johnson Sapp from Rosenstein School. Now I'm gonna announce that our first place winner is gonna receive $750 cash prize, as well as our trophy that they get to take back to their school and put on display. 
And that individual um, is also the recipient of our People's Choice Award, which comes with a $350 prize. And so Lynn Williamson, who was last year's 3MT competitor winner, is back here to do the honors of announcing the winner and the, the People's Choice Award. Okay. Great. So the winner and People's Choice Award winner of the 2023 uh, Three Minute Thesis competition is Acadia Morrison. <laughs> Thank you everyone, have a wonderful rest of your evening.